Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Haley Hassler, and today I'll be presenting on the optimal frequency of mRNA boosting against SARS-CoV-2. Over the past two years, scientists have been asked hundreds of thousands of questions regarding the COVID-19 vaccine. Some of these include, should I get the COVID-19 booster? Is one vaccine better than another? Can you get both the flu and the COVID vaccine together? And yes, even, did Bill Gates put microchips or trackers into the COVID-19 vaccines? And while we've done an unimaginable job at answering and debunking these questions over such a short period of time, those that remain require decades of empirical research and data collection to answer, as these questions concern the duration of immunity conferred by vaccination. And in fact, several of these questions were highlighted earlier this year in a piece by Science entitled, What's Next for COVID-19 Vaccines? Scientists and regulators chart a course amid uncertainty. So what uncertainty are they referring to? Well, in the piece, they highlight first, how often will we need boosters and who should receive them? Second, should vaccines continue to be updated as new variants emerge? Third, are people who have had COVID and multiple vaccines better protected? And finally, for how long? And it's these questions exactly that our group has been leveraging comparative evolutionary analyses to answer. So how have we done it? Well, back in 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic, before we had access to vaccines, one of the first big uncertain questions was how long would you be protected following natural infection by the virus? which, of course, was occurring rampantly. And as with the vaccine, determining the answer to that question for natural infection also requires decades of data collection to answer. Because what you essentially need is to follow a large cohort of individuals, routinely record their antibody levels against the virus, and track reinfection events for years to get a sense of the average duration of protection, which, of course, we didn't have at the time for SARS-CoV-2. However, thanks to the timely work published by Edred et al. in 2020, that information had been collected for nearly three decades for SARS-CoV-2's closest endemic relatives, which include HCOV-229E, NL63, and OC43, in addition to waning antibody data published by Koei and Lee for MERS and SARS-CoV-1. And using their data, as well as short-term SARS-CoV-2 antibody waning data, published just months after the pandemic began, we performed ancestral and descendant state reconstruction on the coronavirus phylogeny and were able to impute the durability of immunity against SARS-CoV-2 over time. So now that we are a couple of years post the onset of the pandemic, where we've seen countless reinfection events, I'm sure you're all wondering, were our predictions accurate? In short, yes. Before reinfection was commonplace, we predicted that about 450 days after primary infection, you'd have a 34% probability of reinfection. This prediction was nearly spot on to a study published last year that found that there was a 34% probability of reinfection between 420 to 480 days after infection. Additionally, in an earlier study, they found an 18% probability of reinfection after roughly 275 to 300 days, where we predicted 18% by 270 days post-infection. Again, this underscored to us the predictive utility of the traditionally historic field of evolutionary biology. And given the validity of our natural infection results, when the vaccines came out and data on antibody levels began to be published, we immediately turned our attention to the same question for vaccines. How long would we possess protection against the virus following vaccination? Which brings me back to the uncertainty posed in the science article. Just as we provided highly concordant predictions following natural infection, here we've answered two more outstanding questions. How long does your immunity last post-vaccination? And how frequently should you receive a booster, which we determine for both immune typical individuals and immunocompromised individuals undergoing various cancer treatments, 
To extend our natural infection model to the COVID-19 vaccine, we first needed to determine what the peak antibody response was for vaccination relative to natural infection. Because in our original natural infection analysis, as I mentioned previously, we used the coronavirus phylogeny to perform ancestral state reconstruction, where our trait of interest that we were imputing for SARS-CoV-2 was antibody level decline over time. So, in the case of vaccination, if the peak antibody response on the y-axis differed from natural infection, then depending on if it was higher or lower, then the rate of antibody decline would happen over a longer or shorter time scale on the x-axis. And consequently, we could then determine the probability of breakthrough infection over time by placing antibody level response into a probabilistic framework. So here, with that probability on the y-axis, if the vaccine elicited a higher peak antibody response, then your probability of breakthrough infection would remain low for a longer period of time, whereas a lower peak antibody response would result in a higher probability of infection over a shorter period of time. So essentially, we'd want our antibody response conferred by vaccination to be high. But before we could determine that response to vaccination, we first had to find data that met very specific criteria, which included, first, that their data was sampled near peak antibody response, which was about 25 to 30 days post-vaccination. Second, all subjects included had to be COVID-naive prior to data collection. Third, vaccination had to be administered at the proper intervals. And finally, each study had to have a comparator to a control group which was natural infection for our immune typical analysis and healthy vaccinated individuals for our immunocompromised analysis. Based on this criteria, we found a study published in 2021 that allowed us to determine that relative to natural infection, the Pfizer mRNA vaccine resulted in a 150% increase in antibody response, which meant that the vaccine would possess a higher peak antibody response compared to natural infection, thereby extending the durability of immunity over time. And in fact, we compared our mRNA vaccine waning antibody results that were published in 2022 to an empirical waning antibody study published a little over a month ago and found that, again, our predictions were highly concordant to the observations, where we estimated antibody levels of 0.85 by nine months and they observed antibody levels of 0.88 by 9 to 10 months. So what does this mean for the probability of breakthrough infection over time? Well, relative to natural infection, this higher peak antibody response induced by vaccination resulted in a probability of breakthrough infection on the y-axis that remained low for a longer period of time, suggesting that even if you have been naturally infected previously, the booster can confer better and longer protection. Now, these results provided an answer for us regarding how long you'd be protected by the vaccine. But as we all know, the virus is constantly evolving. And as a result, we need to continually get updated boosters. So we extended our approach beyond just primary vaccination to boosting with the Pfizer vaccine, where here we wanted to determine how frequently you should receive a booster to provide sufficient protection. To do so, we again first needed to determine what the peak antibody response was to boosting relative this time to primary vaccination. And we collected this information from a study published late last year, which showed that the peak antibody response after boosting was slightly higher than that of primary vaccination. So, the question remaining now is what is the optimal timing of administering these boosters? Well, by projecting the cumulative probability of breakthrough infection following booster administration every six months, one year, one and a half years, two years, and three years, we first found that compared to receiving no booster over the next six years, simply receiving two boosters, one every three years, only reduced your cumulative probability of breakthrough infection 
from 87 to 77 percent, and that both booster timings of every two years and every one and a half years still resulted in cumulative probabilities of breakthrough infection higher than 50 percent over the next six years. In contrast, yearly booster administration and bi-yearly administration resulted in the lowest cumulative probabilities of breakthrough infection over the next six years. This suggests that receiving COVID boosters around the same frequency as the flu shot would provide sufficient protection against future infections. Now, these results provide an answer to our second question regarding the optimal frequency of boosting, but they only represent immune-typical individuals. And as we know, those at the greatest risk of severe infection have compromised immune systems. So we also wanted to provide treatment-specific predictive frequencies for the over 18 million individuals undergoing various cancer treatments worldwide. To do so, we again needed to adjust peak antibody responses to those elicited by each treatment. And clearing all of our inclusion criteria, we found a primary and a follow-up study comparing healthy controls to seven of the most popular forms of cancer treatment. These treatments range from taking rituximab, which actually attacks your B cells, to chemotherapy, to even no treatment at all. So for this group of people, what does boosting look like for them over the next two years of their treatment? Well, we found that relative to immune-typical individuals, those undergoing targeted or hormonal treatments, hemopoietic stem cell transplantation, immunotherapy, and chemotherapy plus immunotherapy, possessed cumulative probabilities of breakthrough infection on the y-axis, similar to those of the general population, suggesting that yearly, in yellow, or bi-yearly vaccination in green, would provide sufficient protection for these individuals. In contrast, those receiving chemotherapy, no treatment, or particularly the B-cell depleting drug rituximab, were not protected sufficiently relative to immune-typical individuals, and consequently required quarterly to monthly boosting to provide sufficient protection. This suggests that additional protective measures would be necessary for this subset of immunocompromised cancer patients, as they possess the highest risk of infection. So where does this leave us regarding the uncertainty remaining for COVID-19 vaccines? Well, here we have leveraged the immense predictive utility of comparative evolution analyses to demonstrate that first, mRNA vaccines are projected to provide immunity against SARS-CoV-2 breakthrough infection over a longer duration compared to immunity derived by natural infection. Additionally, we've demonstrated that delayed administration of boosters is of high consequence to the cumulative probability of individual infection by SARS-CoV-2 and correspondingly to the course of ongoing disease spread, prevalence, morbidity, hospitalization, and mortality, particularly for those at the highest risk of infection. And finally, instituting regular yearly population-wide booster vaccination updated to predominant variants has the potential to substantially forestall and with widespread uptake, significantly protect against COVID-19. Finally, I'd like to thank my co-authors Jeffrey Townsend at Yale and Alex Dornberg at UNC Charlotte for their tremendous guidance and contributions, as well as several others from Yale for their additional help and our funding from the NSF. Thank you all very, very much for your time.